Chapter 1 When Brittany was eight years old, her parents moved to a new house. Everything was new. New nanny, new housekeeper, new school, new teacher, and new students. While Brittany didn't enjoy change, she was told by her daddy she would have to accept that things were going to be different in their new life. He had landed an important job, working with an important man, which meant he couldn't spend as much time with her and Mommy. But Daddy knew Brittany would do just fine. All she had to do was focus on her goals, and she could do anything she set her mind to. Two weeks into her new school, Brittany felt like she wasn't fitting in very well. She missed her old friends. It didn't help when one of the girls had called her a teacher's pet. Brittany liked to know the answers. Daddy encouraged her to learn everything she could. He said the more she knew, the more successful in life she would be. While she was getting good marks, she wasn't making new friends. Then it happened. One of the boys in her class tripped her at recess. Brittany fell hard on the grass, her knee and wrist stinging from the impact. For a moment she lay stunned on the ground. No one had ever been so mean to her before. Children's laughter filled her ears, and Brittany looked up to see a group of kids giggling and pointing at her. "'What are you going to do, teacher's pet?' one of her antagonists taunted. "'Are you going to be a tattletale, too?' another asked. "'Maybe she'll cry,' a boy said callously. "'Cry, baby.' "'I won't cry,' Brittany viciously told herself. Instinctively, she knew crying would be a bigger humiliation." Ignoring the twinge in her wrist, she stumbled to her feet, biting the inside of her cheek to prevent any tears. Taking a quivering breath, she waited to see what they would do next. "'Are you okay?' Brittany squinted against the sun as she turned to look at the newcomer. He was tossing a soccer ball between two hands, dark hair barely visible in the sun, as it backlit his tall, skinny form. She found herself replying, I'm okay. He gave her a last look before tossing the ball at the boy who had tripped her. Come on, let's play soccer. The boys all followed him out to the field. Left behind, the rest of the crowd scattered to play their own games. Brittany looked around to see one of the nerdier kids reading a book. Hey, who was that? Gabe Ramsley, he informed her, pushing up his glasses. He's a great ahead of us. Brittany looked at her rescuer, easily dodging the other boys as he smoothly kicked the ball across the soccer field. He grinned happily as he scored a goal, his team slapping him on the back and high-fiving him. Before meeting Gabe, Brittany had always found the princess movies her nanny made her watch to be a bit silly. Why did the boy prince always get to rescue the girl princess? Why couldn't the princess just rescue herself? Daddy always said people would do whatever they wanted if they just worked hard enough. Brittany often wondered if the girl princesses were just lazy. Now, for the first time in her life, Brittany understood those movies. Being rescued from a hard situation was a nice thing. As she watched Gabe race across the grass, her heart fluttered a little in her chest. The next day, she asked if she could sit beside him at lunch in the cafeteria. He said no. Undeterred, Brittany asked if she could play soccer with his group. He said no because girls have cooties. Brittany thought hard about her situation. He was her rescuing prince. She was a princess since Daddy always called her so. She was smart, and she could solve this just like solving a math puzzle in class. All she had to do was think it through, create a plan, and proceed. It came to her as she lay in bed one night on the pink sheets which her mother had bought. Brittany didn't even like pink. She liked blue, like Gabe's eyes. That's it! Brittany sat up in bed. If Gabe was going to like her, she needed to know everything about him. Like the same things that he did. If they liked the same things, then they were sure to become friends. With a heavy sigh, she fell back onto her bed with all its pinkness. She wasn't around Gabe enough to find out what he liked. It wasn't as though she could ask her older brother Jordan either, as he was not in Gabe's class being two years older than Brittany. 
thinking hard, she knew she could overcome this problem. As she drifted off to sleep, a new thought came to her. The next day, Brittany put her plan into action. She marched up to her teacher and demanded to know what she needed to do to be put ahead a grade. She skipped a grade to get into my class. She switched school districts to get into my secondary school academy. Now she's trying to get on the all-boys swim team, declaring it is discriminatory to close the team to girls. A 16-year-old Gabe groaned as he flopped onto Noah's bed. It was the annual Ramsley family get-together, and the older boys were all gathered in Noah's room as the younger set took over the basement. I wish I'd gone to an all-boys school, but I get the feeling she just cut her hair and petitioned to join anyways. <laughs> Sounds like she has a crush on you, smirked Noah as he grabbed a box of contraband candy out of his closet. He selected a bag of buttered popcorn before handing the box to Max. Their mother, Rachel, was currently on a health diet fad and refused to allow junk food in the house. It's a boys' team? Jake's tone was practical as he selected a candy bar out of the box Max was thoughtfully offering around, which means it would naturally preclude girls from joining it. The girls have their own team which she can join. That's what the coach said, but they're giving her a hearing where she gets to prove her point, and the student council gets to vote on it, said Gabe as he flung an arm over his eyes. My friend Tucker mentioned I like girls with punk green hair, and she dyed her hair. It looks awful. Two years, then you're in college, reasoned Henry. He opened a bag of flavored corn chips. Just don't tell her where you're going, and she can't find you. Two years is too long, lamented Gabe. I need to get her to go away now. Tell her you're playing for the other team, and girls just don't do it for you, shrugged an unconcerned Noah, or get a girlfriend. She has a habit of chasing away anyone I like, groused Gabe. Girls tend to be turned off by a guy who comes with his very own stalker. Well, I'm out of ideas. Noah grabbed a handful of assorted nuts and shared some with Jake. Where is Michael? Stuck with the old dudes talking shop. Jake crunched loudly. I saw them in the study. He's supposed to be getting the drinks, complained Max. How is he going to sneak them past your mom? Asked Henry as he popped open a container of dip chip. Aunt Rachel has eyes in the back of her head. She misses nothing. Once, I tried to bring in a turtle we found on the beach, and she knew instantly. There was no way she could have seen it. It was under my shirt. Michael would have made you put the turtle back anyways, Max advised his cousin as he looked through their depleted supplies, choosing to open a pack of red licorice. Can we get back to the issue at hand? Gabe opened an eye, removing his arm so he could see his cousin's. What issue is that? Michael asked as he entered the room, shutting the door behind himself. We are thirsty, Max pointed out. There's nothing to drink. Gabe has a girlfriend, added Jake with a cheeky grin. Brittany Crawford is not my girlfriend, Jake declared hotly, his face flushing a little at the thought. She's more of a stalker, clarified Noah. Soda and cups are under the bed. Michael said mildly as he took a seat at Noah's desk. I snuck them in hours ago when Mum was distracted. Just soda? Henry cocked an eyebrow from his seat in the beanbag chair. Just soda, said Michael firmly to the group of teens. I can't wait to be a grown-up, spoke Jake, finishing his candy bar. College parties are going to be so much better than high school ones. They were about the same, shrugged Michael, only the alcohol is bought legally. Somehow I don't see you as the parting type, frowned Jake as his oldest cousin. Guilty, Michael easily responded. Being an adult means being more responsible. May I never get that dull, Max offered Michael a piece of licorice, which he accepted. When I'm an adult, I can get a restraining order, muttered Gabe darkly. Ah, oh, she's not all that bad, chuckled Henry. I thought the song she sang for the talent show was kind of funny. It was embarrassing. Gabe put a pillow over his face. Max fell into a fit of laughter. It was great. She can't carry a tune. Plus, everyone knew she was singing about you, chortled Noah as he pulled out bottles of soda from under the bed. You should have seen it, Michael, 
Jake told him. Everyone loved it. Except me, noted Gabe with a muffled voice. Have you ever just sat her down and nicely told her you aren't interested? suggested Michael. Only every day of my life, lamented Gabe. Michael did say nicely, Max pointed out as he passed around cups he had rummaged from under the bed. I think you've been more forceful than nice. Just have an honest conversation with her. Michael accepted a cup. I'm sure you can manage to let her down gently. She has a list, grumbled Gabe. A list? frowned Henry as he poured out drinks. A list of all the reasons they should be together, Max said gleefully. She calls it her compatibility list. Every time he starts to tell her why he doesn't want to be her boyfriend, Britt pulls it out and starts spouting about how much they have in common. It's laminated. She is determined, commented Michael, a little surprised at the girl's tenacity. You don't know the half of it, sighed Gabe. I can't go anywhere without her popping up. The mall, the movies, the beach. She goes everywhere I go. I'm surprised she's not ringing the doorbell right now. They all froze as they heard the telltale chime from the front door. No way, breathed Jake. Gabe peeled away the pillow, staring at the bedroom door in trepidation, as they all strained to hear who might be at the front entryway. Michael checked his watch. It's likely the caterers. They usually come around now to set up. What if it isn't? Noah quirked an eyebrow. Or what if Brittany got a part-time job with the catering company just so that she could come here to chase Gabe? Gabe threw the pillow at Noah, causing him to spill his drink. Paper towels are under the bed, remarked Michael dryly amongst the rest of the boys' laughter. Maybe you should tone it down a little, said Tara doubtfully. Guys like to do the chasing. Where did you hear that? puffed Brittany as she vigorously pedaled the spin bike. Only in every woman's magazine ever written, replied Tara as she checked the stopwatch to see how long Brittany had to go. Two minutes. I don't have time for magazines. Brittany focused on powering through. I have three more exams, all my club activities, and a Coval Victorian speech to write. Besides, I thought proximity was supposed to win people over. Not in Gabe's case. Tara eyed the sweating Brittany, although lately it has become more of a competition between the both of you to see who can get better grades, better career paths, better everything. I was shocked when they announced the both of you were going to be Victorians together. Even the professors can feel the animosity between both of you. It is not my fault he is too dumb to see that I would be perfect for him, huffed Brittany. I'm getting to the point where I just want to finish college and get into the professional world. I need to leave my childish infatuation of Gabe Ramsley behind where it belongs. Fairy tales and happily ever afters just aren't reality. Well, they do say absence makes the heart grow fonder, said Tara doubtfully. Do you think so? Brittany looked a little hopeful at the prospect. In your case, no. I think absence will help both of you to move on. Tara clicked the stopwatch. You are done. Thank you. Brittany slumped over the bike, dragging in deep breaths. He is watching you. Tara snuck a look at Gabe and his friends. Immediately, Brittany straightened up, grabbing her water bottle and towel, trying to act like her workout had been no big deal. I'm going over to talk to them, decided Tara. What? No, why? Brittany grabbed her friend's arm in alarm. To see if they're going to the year-end party Kim is throwing? Gently, Tara explained. She has a pool. Her parents are away, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Well, I'm not going if he's going, said a stubborn Brittany. Honestly, Britt, I don't care anymore. I love you to pieces, but this thing between you and Gabe is just too much work, sighed Tara. All I want to know is if Max is going. If he is, I plan on being there and being available. Oh, Brittany felt a little deflated. What do you mean, oh, demanded Tara. Max is hot and fun. He is better looking than Gabe. He is not, muttered Brittany a little sullenly. She snuck a look at Gabe, who caught her watching him. 
He rolled his eyes and turned away to talk to the group of guys hanging out by the weights. To her mind, Gabe would always be the best-looking guy she had seen. Even after all this time, he still made her heart do funny flips and wish for a future that wasn't going to be. Too bad he didn't care about her. She had tried changing who she was to fit what she thought his ideal was. Instead, she had ended up looking like a freak thanks to the bad advice of his friends. It had been one big joke on her. Since then, Brittany had resolved not to change who she was. She knew she was perfect for Gabe and he for her, even if he refused to admit it. She had tried to make him jealous. That had been an utter failure. She had tried to flirt, which was worse than her singing, and Brittany was a terrible singer. She made dogs howl and cats run for cover. Finally, she had just done everything she could to make Gabe almost as miserable as she was. They competed over everything, argued over everything, annoyed each other to the extreme. If Gabe was going to do something, Brittany was going to do it better. She had hoped to make her heart see just what a jerk Gabe could be. That hadn't worked either. The traitorous muscle had still beat harder every time he entered the room. It did jumping jacks every time his blue eyes looked her way. It practically swooned when he opened his mouth and spoke in the rich velvet voice of his. It was absolutely maddening. Now, nearing the end of college, Brittany was tasting failure. Their valid Victorian speech was likely the last time she would see Gabe, except at social events where he did his best to avoid her. It was depressing. Glancing up, Brittany saw Tara flirting happily with the guys. It hurt that Gabe gave her friend a big smile and talked easily to her. What Brittany wouldn't give to have him look at her like he was looking at Tara. With a sigh, she grabbed her towel and went to the locker room. She swallowed past the lump in her throat and tried to ignore wishful thinking. Princes weren't all they were cracked up to be, and sometimes Daddy was dead wrong. No amount of effort was going to make Gabriel Ramsley hers. Gabe heaved an internal sigh as he recognized Brittany Crawford. A little older, a little classier looking, and more put together, she was waiting by the doors of the building, watching him approach. No doubt to offer condolences to the Ramsley family for the passing of his cousin Nathaniel. He wished she wouldn't. Britt and he had never gotten along. She was abrupt, rude, and had a habit of picking on him. She was a know-it-all. Somehow he had gotten paired with her a lot for school projects, plays, and on student council. She had always been around. When Gabe had graduated and gone on to work in the family company that managed a chain of hospitals, he had been more than happy to leave her behind. Here she was again. It was only natural to see her. They hung around in the same social circles. Her dad did business with the Ramsley family. While Gabe was a master of getting out of doing the social whirl, he still had to occasionally do it, and it wasn't something he enjoyed. It was necessary for the continuous fundraising efforts for the chain of hospitals his branch of the Ramsley family managed. Brittany? He managed to keep his voice neutral. It had been a few years since they had last met. Perhaps she had grown up. Or maybe his memories of her were a little flawed by his personal dislike of her. Gabriel, she returned, eyeing him critically, you have gained weight. Good to see you, too, he said wryly, annoyed. She was the exact same, a sharp tongue in a womanly package. You should watch your diet, she advised him, especially after your uncle had a heart attack and now this death. If you are not careful, you will become like your cousin Ben. Ben is fine, defended Gabe. Okay so Ben could stand to lose some weight. The guy was rather hefty. Gabe thought of himself as a little husky. He was only carrying an extra 25 to 30 pounds since his college days. Not something to be worried about. As for Uncle David having a heart attack, they weren't quite sure if that was what had happened yet. The doctors were still running tests. If you got a wife, she could look after you and make sure you stay healthy, Brittany pointed out. She followed him into the funeral chapel, oblivious of the fact that her company was unwanted. 
I'm fine. Gabe was not about to go all veggie tray. Maybe he could step it up at the gym a little. Angrily, he shoved the thought away. He was always letting Britt do this, making him feel insecure. Her opinion shouldn't matter. It didn't matter. He almost missed her next words. You could marry me and I'll look after you, offered Brittany, entirely serious. Gabe's jaw dropped. He was absolutely gobsmacked. He didn't know what to say. It makes sense, continued Brittany. We come from the same social circles. I know everything important about you. We're of a compatible age group. Genetically, our children would be of excellent stock. Do you hear yourself when you speak? asked Gabe, incredulous at her reasoning. She was absolutely out of line. We are at a funeral for my cousin. Another good point in favor of her marriage, stated Brittany firmly, daring him to contradict her. Life is fleeting. I'm sure you would like progeny, as every male with a large inheritance usually does want to pass on his legacy to his kids. Medically, I'm in excellent health, and I should be able to easily supply you with children. I don't believe you. Gabe bit out the words. He moved past her to get a program from the attendant. I had my fertility checked, she followed, getting her own program. I assure you, I'm fully capable of conceiving children. I meant, I can't believe you are saying this. Especially today of all days, he hissed at her. We are not getting married. Brittany blinked. Are you certain you have fully thought this through? I've weighed the pros and cons. The positive list far outweighs the negatives. Not for me, growled Gabe. He abruptly turned on his heel, ignoring if it might seem rude to leave her standing there alone. Gabe wasn't sure he cared. Brittany was disconcerting. He simply wished to get away from her. He found himself in the meeting room for the pallbearers. Gabe drew in a deep breath as he saw Michael, Jake, Everett, and Ben. Michael, Jake, and Gabe were all the oldest of each family of brothers. Everett and Nate had been best friends growing up. Ben and Henry were Nate's brothers. Gabe wondered if Henry had made it back in time from Hong Kong, where he managed the Asian network of Ramsley Hotels. Nate Ramsley had died of a massive heart attack while training for a marathon. Running was something he did all the time. It was the biggest thing in common Everett and Nate had. They had been in all sorts of marathons together, until Everett had gone to Europe to try to expand Ramsley Insurance Corporation into the market overseas. Nate had been young and fit. Now he was gone, leaving behind a wife and two children. It was a hard thing to think about, Gabe reflected. However, it wasn't something that would get him thinking about getting hitched, especially to Brittany Crawford. What worm had crawled into her brain to make her think it was even a remote possibility? She was crazy. Gabe pushed the thought of matrimony out of his head. It had no place with what was happening here today. Are you okay? Ben quirked an eyebrow as he came to stand beside Gabe. You have kind of a funny look on your face. Sometime we'll have a drink and I will explain it all. You'll probably get a kick out of it, muttered Gabe. Everyone except Gabe was usually amused by Brittany's antics. He eyed Ben, who looked like he might have put on a little more weight. Either that or the suit was a little tight. And if such were the case, Ben needed a new tailor. Gabe resolutely put Brittany's comparison of his possible future physique to Ben out of his mind. How are you holding up? Ben shrugged as he looked away. The kids are asking when Nate's coming back. Cora is a mess. Henry's flight is delayed. If he can't make it here in the next ten minutes, we'll have to get Noah to take his spot. Gabe digested his cousin's words before asking gently, What about you? Ben drew in a steadying breath. I always thought that out of all of us, Nate would be the one to live to a hundred. He was always so healthy. Gabe put a hand on Ben's shoulder in sympathy. At thirty-three, Ben was the youngest of his cousins. Second youngest, Gabe silently amended to himself. Now that they knew about Uncle David's extramarital activities, they had more cousins in the Colburn brothers. Addison is sitting out with Cora and the kids, Ben informed him. That's good. 
murmured Gabe. Addison was the only woman in the slew of male cousins which made up the Ramsley family. Henry. Ben moved forward to greet his brother as a tired Henry set down his carry-on bag. The two embraced, and the rest of the room greeted Henry by turns as they waited for the last of the mourners to be seated before the funeral. What had she been thinking? Brittany wanted to put her head in her hands and just hide in the washroom. Instead, she gathered up what was left of her dignity and left the stall to wash her hands. It was always like this. Somehow, her brain shut off and her mouth started running whenever Gabe was around. It was like he brought out the very worst in her, even while she was trying to impress him. Talking about fertility and her overall health as though the logic of it would convince him to like her. Brittany cringed as she eyed herself in the mirror. For the first time ever, she was a liar. Just two days ago, she had gotten the worst news of her life. Her health wasn't perfect. Brittany had known something was wrong, which is why she had gone for tests. She had pain and unusual bleeding for the past few months. The doctor had informed her she had stage 1 endometrial cancer. He had said she was lucky to have noticed the symptoms and gotten checked out so quickly. Brittany didn't feel lucky when he recommended her uterus be removed. The risk was low the cancer would spread quickly but surgery was considered the optimal solution. Followed by rounds of drugs to be certain the cancer was eradicated and scheduled screenings to see if it came back. If she had the surgery, she would never be a mom. Oh, she might adopt, but to never be pregnant, to never know what it was like to feel a baby kick, to have life grow inside her. It was something precious to her and millions of other women. Brittany had always thought she would have kids. It had never been a question in her mind she would get married. However, she had never wanted to marry anyone other than Gabe. No matter who she dated, they just never measured up, never made her heart beat even the tiniest of bits faster. By the look of horror on his face when she had made the ill-timed suggestion, Brittany was the last person Gabe would ever want to marry. She didn't know why she had let her mother guilt her into coming. It was something about how the Crawfords and Ramsley families needed to support each other since Daddy and David Ramsley had done business together. You know why you came, a little voice inside her head prompted. You wanted to see Gabe again. Brittany gave a sigh. Wash those hands any longer and they'll start to wrinkle, the woman beside her smiled. I'm trying to delay the inevitable. Brittany gave a wry smile in return before shutting off the faucet and reaching for a soft towel. One of the Ramsleys and I aren't getting along too well right now. Oh? she gently pried, waiting for Brittany to explain further. I might be to blame. I have a bad habit of opening my mouth and inserting my foot. He always brings out the worst in me somehow, grimaced Brittany. I'm sorry, I don't even know you, and here I am being indiscreet again. Holly Urshman. Holly extended a hand. I came with Molson Colburn. Ah, the Colburns. Brittany acknowledged the connection to the Ramsleys. What are they like? Impossible at times, but much softer than they try to appear. Bethany Searson came out of a stall and joined them at the counter. Hello, Brittany. It's good to see you again. Mother told me you were going out with the older Colburn, said Brittany as she eyed Bethany. She looked happier than Brittany had ever seen her before. I'm engaged to him. Bethany gave her a smile as she finished washing her hands. We we're working on wedding plans. Congratulations. Brittany tried not to feel jealous. She was happy for Bethany. Everyone deserved their heart's desire, and it was obvious Bethany was pleased to be getting married. She just wished it was herself announcing an engagement. Suddenly, there was so little time in her life for two of the biggest milestones a woman could experience. It was nice to meet you. Holly checked her watch. We should be getting seated. It's almost time. Good to meet you as well, Brittany's mother's drills on good manners made her say. She followed them out into the hallway, then watched in curiosity as they were seated with two handsome men inside the chapel. Not as handsome as Gabe, but still handsome enough, she supposed. 
The affection between the brothers and their girlfriends was easy enough to see as Bethany latched onto the arm of the older one, and the younger brother put an arm around Holly's shoulders, whispering something in her ear. Bethany looked around, spotting her mother. Naomi Crawford had saved a seat for Bethany. Erwin Crawford, Brittany's father, wasn't in attendance. Right now, he was sitting in prison with the FBI, grilling him for harboring a known felon. Daddy had given sanctuary to David Ramsley while David was on the run, trying to escape charges of drug smuggling and money laundering. Daddy had even gone so far as to try to drive David to a private airport to help him evade capture by the authorities. Daddy's loyalties to the man who had made his lifestyle possible knew no bounds. The two men had made countless business deals over the decades. Now Irwin was facing the very real possibility of spending some time in prison for his aiding David. Brittany had mixed emotions over the whole thing. She could admire Daddy's loyalty. However, he had been breaking the law. It made her wonder just how involved he really was in the whole Ramsley scandal. She had tried to voice her concerns to her mother multiple times, but had been shut out. Naomi refused to discuss the matter, saying it was men's business and Irwin was taking care of it. Because Daddy did so well at taking care of things lately, Brittany thought with some sarcasm. After all, he was the one in prison awaiting trial, and it was Brittany footing her mother's bills since Daddy's bank accounts were frozen by the FBI. Benjamin Ramsley has gained some more weight, tutted Naomi, her lips pursing in disapproval as she watched the men walk past. Is Henry's suit even ironed? It's a poor job of it if it even was. He looks far too thin next to Ben. They've gotten the order mixed up. I thought it was Henry, Nate, Garrett, Addison, and then Ben. Brittany bit the inside of her cheek. Did she really sound like her mother when she spoke? Gabe had once accused her of being critical and rude like Naomi. Or maybe it just happened when she was around Gabe. For some reason, she could never be normal around him. She wasn't much of a people person to begin with, but she wasn't as bad as when she was around Gabe. Tamping down her feelings of inadequacy, Brittany opened her program, staring at the pages as the last of the family was seated. Gabriel Winston Ramsley Brittany tried to ignore the familiar words. She had written them countless times with hearts connected to her own Brittany Helena Crawford. Annoyed with herself, she flipped through the pages only to be distracted by her mother's gasp of astonishment, which was joined by many others in the congregation. What happened? whispered Brittany as she jerked her head up to see someone flag down the funeral director and some of the Ramsley men go forward to one of the benches. James Ramsley just collapsed, reported Naomi as she stood for a better view. Brittany blinked in surprise. She hadn't realized Gabe's father would be in attendance at Nate's funeral. All of Gabe's uncles were currently in prison, each charged with his part in David Ramsley's schemes. Had James not participated in his brother's illegal activities? Her heart in her throat, she came to her feet like many others to try to see better what was going on. While the rest of the people might be looking to see how James was, Brittany had only eyes for a worried Gabe. If you enjoyed this chapter of Convincing Him, Book 9 of the Ramsley Brothers series, look for Chapter 2. Please consider subscribing to the channel. That way you won't miss any new chapters in the future. Happy listening!